Whew. A lot of people have been asking for this video. Before we get started with this video, please support the channel by pressing the subscribe button below this video and hit that bell if you want to be one of the first ones to know when we drop a new video. Paint correction, paint polishing, removing scratches and swirls can be very intimidating if you've never corrected paint before. But in today's video, I'm going to try to make it easy as possible. I'm going to give you a crash course in paint correction. With so many different variables when it comes to paint correction, I can see why people are intimidated when it comes to this process. You have different machines. You have different types of paint to work on. You have different products, pads, arm speeds, pressures, and then machine speeds. I'm gonna try to explain everything to you in order so it makes sense so you can start paint correcting yourself. We're gonna start off with different machines. Now there are a variety of different machines. You have rotary polishers, you have forced rotation polishers, you have DA polishers, short throw and long throw DA polishers. And then you have different size for all these polishers. First type of polisher I wanna tell you about is this rotary high speed polisher. Uh, this is what I started off using. I don't use it anymore with the innovations of some other polishers in the detailing industry, but this this is a staple. I mean, there's we haven't used it in the shop for a very long time, I'll tell you that much, but there are times, certain situations where this will come in in handy. This is a hard machine to master. This is a rotary polishing machine, means it just spins in one direction. It doesn't oscillate at all. Unlike some of these bigger machines, the Rupes machine here, this is a DA or a dual action polisher. So that means it's gonna spin, but it also rotates. So it gives you two different actions. What that does is help with dispersing the heat. So heat's a byproduct when you're polishing. Uh, you're gonna have heat, you're gonna heat up the panel. Heat is fine, but too much heat can be damaging. The next machine is a forced rotation machine. This is very similar to a dual action polisher, but with a dual action polisher, the spindle will stop rotating under pressure, where a forced rotation DA machine will continue to rotate no matter how much pressure is put on it. You also have different backing plates for each machine here. Uh, you have five inch backing plates, you have three inch backing plates, you have machines that are made for three inch polishers. You you have a two inch and a one inch polisher here for different sections on the car. At our shop, we used to have machines with both five inch and six inch backing plates. This meant we had to carry both five inch and six inch pads. To cut down on cost and confusion, we now just carry machines with a five inch backing plate. There's not a whole lot of difference when it comes to using a five inch versus a six inch machine. If anything, I feel like I have a little more control with a five inch machine. This is a porta cable machine. I've actually started my career with this porta cable machine here. They're cheap, they're like $129. This is a great machine to start off with. It doesn't have as big as a throw as the Rupes machines, but if you're on a budget, this is a great machine to get when you're first starting out. You're gonna be able to do the same thing you can with both these machines, but this is kind of like the Cadillac of machines. I actually have a Harbor Freight buffer at home, which is like 49, 50 bucks. And they're all gonna do the same thing, but after the years of polishing and you spend hours and hours of polishing, you want a machine that's not gonna vibrate and that's what these Rupes machines are known for is they, they have very little vibration. They're very comfortable to use for hours at a time where these machines and the cheaper machines, after a couple of hours of you're using them, you're gonna feel it in your hands. That vibration gets to you and you can feel it in your joints. And if you've done it for years and years like I have, you're really gonna feel it. So you'll appreciate these machines when you're using them on the paint for hours and hours at a time. Another variable you'll have to work with is the type of pads and the products that you're using. And there is tons of them on the market. It can be very confusing as a beginner to know what products and what pads and what combination to use them. Uh, I'm gonna make it again very simple for you. I only carry three pads at the shop. And uh, we have other pads around, but for 95% of the jobs that we're doing here, I can get 
any type of work done that I need to with those three pads. Uh, those three pads that I'm gonna show you right now is one of them is a microfiber pad. This is a cutting pad. So when you're polishing paint, you have a couple different steps. You can have a cutting step, which is to remove heavy defects. We're gonna remove the bigger scratches and swirls first. And then we're gonna do a second step to refine the paint. After you use a heavy cutting pad like this with a heavy cutting compound, usually you're gonna have micro haze or swirls left behind. Uh, left from that cutting stage. These microfiber cutting pads uh, are kind of new to the industry. They're relatively, uh, they, about five or six years ago, these came out and they've changed the way a lot of people polish paint because they cut very, very well. They cut fast and they finish down very well to where people used to use three steps, four steps, and now you can kind of cut it down to two steps. You're gonna have a cutting step and you're gonna have a polishing step. So this is, our main cutting pad that we use here, the microfiber Lake Country pad. Another pad that you're gonna see out there is wool pads. And I, I wanna tell you about these, but uh, make it simple as possible. Wool pads, usually for rotary buffers, and you're usually gonna use them after you have wet sanded something. So if you have a job, especially in the body shop industry, if they've just painted something, they wet sand all the orange peel out, they're gonna use a foam pad. And a foam pad and a rotary buffer cuts paint very, very fast. And you can do that when you've just painted a car because you have lots of clear coat. When you have factory clear coat, which is a lot thinner than a repaint, you don't wanna mow down paint that fast. So that's why this has become pretty much obsolete in the detailing industry. Foam pads, you have different types of foam pads you have, and they come in all different colors, and the colors usually represent on how coarse or how fine the foam pad is. So you have an orange or you have a yellow. Orange and yellow are usually heavier cut. So if you're working on a different paint system, depending on whether the paint is hard or soft, and we'll get into more of that uh, as we go on here. So if you can, you, you can cut with these. You can use a, a compound and you can cut paint with these. Take small layers off. If you're working on a, a soft paint, if you're working on a harder paint or a medium hard paint, you probably wanna go with uh, a heavier cut pad with a microfiber. But these foam pads, these coarser foam pads can cut. And then you have softer pads. When you come down to the black and the white and the blue, these are typically finishing pads. So you use this with a polish and this will refine the paint and take out all that micro swirling that you have from using a heavier pad and heavier compound. And this will finish the paint out and it'll leave it nice and shiny and ready for your last step of protection, whether that's a wax or a sealant or a ceramic coating. I've tried to make everything as simple as possible in my shops and uh, we only typically only use three pads. I have other pads in the shop, but these are the three main pads that we use. Cutting, finishing, one step polish and wax. This is more for like a maintenance. We'll also use this if we have a really soft paint. If we are working on a Tesla or a Porsche and it has really soft paint, we might switch to this one and we can actually cut with this one if we use a uh, finer polish. So depending on the job, we'll use one of these three pads. And we're gonna go through all the different variations on what you need to do and how you would go about choosing these different pads and polishes depending on what paint system that you're working on. All right, moving on to the next variable, which is compounds and polishes, your different products. You have all kinds of different brands and you have all kinds of different types of compounds. You have heavy cut compounds, fine cut compounds, medium compounds, polishing. You have fine polishing, you have jeweling polishing, you have diminishing abrasives and you have micro abrasives. It can be confusing. What it boils down to is you have two different types. You have a cutting and you have a finishing. Just think of that. All you need is something to cut the paint and something to finish the paint. Usually we just use two steps here. I've used a lot of these products throughout the years. And again, I've tried to make it as simple as possible when it comes to using these types of products. The latest product that we've started using is this Oberk. Oberk has two steps. It's a step one and a step two. Step one, you're gonna cut. Step two, you're gonna finish down the paint. Simple, easy. You can find that in a lot of systems. The Meguiar system here, you have an ultra pro speed compound 
and then you have an Ultra Pro finishing polish. Again, it's just two steps. 110, 210. Number one, cut the paint. Number two, finish the paint. So when it comes to deciding which products and which pads and which machines to use, you can put any of these products and machines and pads together in a couple different variations. You gotta think about what are your expectations or what are your customers' expectations and how much time do you have? Because we can spend two hours on this doing a very light polish and it'll enhance the shine a little bit, but it's not gonna look perfect. Or we can spend multiple hours or multiple days making this look as perfect as possible and trying to get out every little scratch and swirl. So, when we come to paint correction, when we come to actually putting the machine on the car, we have to do a test spot and figure out what's the best combination of all these variables to get the desired result that we're looking for or the expected result we're looking for. And we wanna put all these together and find the fastest way to do that. Before we get to putting the polisher on the paint, we wanna make sure the car is clean as possible. This car we've already washed, we used the clay bar and we decontaminated the surface. The next step is to cover up anything that we don't wanna get polishing residue on. Any plastic or rubber trim, I'm gonna tape off with this 3M masking yellow tape. This is gonna keep your pad in optimal condition and it's gonna prevent any staining on the plastic or rubber trim. I hope I'm not uh, jumping around too much for you guys, but uh, there is a lot of information uh, to cover. We're now at the car and we have our machine hooked up and we have our pad ready to go. So we're gonna be using the Rupes LHR 15 Mark III polisher here. And on the back of the polisher, you're gonna see numbers one through six. And this is another variable you have to work with. Um, one is gonna be the slowest speed, and six is gonna be the highest speed. And you can see your RPM scale here. Uh, one, you're at 3,000 RPMs, all the way up to six where you're at 5,200 RPMs, rotations per minute. So I've already let you know we're gonna do two different stages. We're gonna do a cutting stage and we're gonna do a polishing stage. Now when you're working on paint, you have your, your metal, your base, sometimes you'll have metal, sometimes it'll be plastic. You have your, so you have your substrate, you have your primer, you have your base coat, which is your color coat, your pigment, and then you have your clear coat. So we can only correct any defects that are in that top coat, which is the clear coat. And generally, if you rub your fingernail over a scratch, if you find a deeper scratch and you rub your fingernail over it, and if your fingernail catches, the scratch is through the clear coat and you're not gonna be able to machine polish that out because there's only a certain amount of clear coat on the vehicle. If you polish too much, you're gonna be left with a, a blemish or a burn mark known in the industry where you have gone through the clear coat and now you can see pigment or primer or if you go really far, you could probably see metal. So our objective when we're polishing paint is we want this paint to look as good as possible but we want to remove the least amount of clear that we can, because if we, again, if we remove too much clear, it's gonna jeopardize the paint system here. This car that we're gonna polish is a white vehicle and it's very hard to actually see the swirls and the scratches in it, uh, but there are still scratches and swirls. If, for instance, we're working on this black car over here, uh, you can see the scratches and the swirls a lot easier than you can hear. It's still gonna be the same process whether you're working on a white car or if you're working on a dark colored car. It's just you can't see them as much. They're not as predominant as they are on this black vehicle, but it's the same exact process. It's the same type of clear coat. So speed is just another variation that you have to deal with um, when you're machine polishing. And typically, on average, we're gonna use a, a speed between four and five for the cutting on this particular machine. And then we're gonna take it down when we're polishing, when we're refining, we're gonna take it down to uh, two or three. Usually two or three is gonna be uh, your finishing stage. So we're gonna get the pad on the machine. Work as clean as possible. 
when you're polishing paint, anything induced into your pad or anything that's on your vehicle could potentially leave scratches, pigtails. Uh, so you wanna make sure that you're working as clean as possible. This is a brand new pad that we have here. We're gonna put it on the machine. You wanna center it on this pad here. Make sure it's perfectly centered. You can kind of spin it. And we're pretty close there. So we're almost ready to put this on the car and show you guys some techniques on how to polish, but there's some more variables that we want to talk about first. Uh, you have a couple different variables. You have your working area and you have your arm speed, which is how fast you're moving this, this buffer. And then you have your pressure, how hard you're pressing on on the vehicle. So typically you're gonna work in a two by two section. Think of your shoulders. I'm gonna work in a section like this. And I'll show you my arm speed. Typically you want to uh, have a generally a slow arm speed and you can, you can play around with this. And a lot of people uh, have different ways and techniques of doing this too. So if you wanna move fast, if you wanna move slow, Kind of experiment. I I suggest if you're starting off polishing to use your own car, use a friend friend's car that you know, that they know that you're just learning how to do this. Don't start off on a customer's car. Somebody's paying you to do this. You can get panels from the junkyard to practice on. Um, but with these machines nowadays, these rotary or these these DA machines, it's hard to burn paint. I mean, you really have to be going at it to burn paint. So don't be scared. Uh, honestly, you're probably gonna burn point, paint at some point. You're gonna have to test the limits. Everybody does it. Don't be afraid to. Uh, it happens, you can fix it, you can repaint panels. It's not, it's a, it's a really bad feeling, but it's not the end of the world. Typically, uh, when you burn paint, I'll show you some spots that are high spots so you wanna stay away from. So you have, you have edges like this. You have edges like this, and then you have edges on the side here, edges like this. If you're gonna burn paint, you're most likely gonna burn paint on these parts right here. Like I said, heat is a byproduct when you're polishing. It's perfectly normal for these panels to heat up. If you have too much heat, that's a bad thing. And these edges here can heat up faster than these flat parts. So you wanna stay away from these edges from directly going on these edges like this. I typically, when I polish, I'm polishing this section here. And then I'm coming down here and I'm polishing up to that edge there. I'm never directly putting pressure on any type of edges here, even when you're going to doors. I mean, if you wanted to, you could pull this and you can polish like this. But if you get around here, that's when you're going to create a lot of heat on this edge and you can risk burning it. So you want to stay away from that. You can go over this edge here. That's no problem. Just don't say, and you can also, you can go over this. But when you're going over it, take the pressure off the buffer. Don't continuously buff on this line here and don't put any pressure on there. While we're talking about heat, so this is a metal panel here. There's plastic panels, there's carbon fiber, there's different substrates on vehicles that you're working on. So when you're working on a metal panel, heat is gonna dissipate. It's gonna spread throughout this panel. When you're working on a plastic bumper over here, so you got metal here, you got plastic. This plastic, when, you, when heat is introduced to this plastic, there's nowhere for that heat to go. It doesn't spread out, so it stays in one spot here. So when you're working on a plastic bumper, you gotta remember that you can't heat it up as much because there's nowhere for that heat to go. This metal panel is going to cool down a lot faster than this plastic will. So typically when I'm doing a bumper, the front bumper, the back bumper, I'm not putting as much pressure on the, on the buffer here and I'm gonna do more passes so it doesn't heat up as much and I'll, I'll let that cool down and I'll constantly check it with my hand. You'll see me as we start polishing the paint, we'll check how hot it is and you'll feel it. If you feel, if it feels warm, it's okay. If it feels a little bit hot, okay. If it, if you take your hand and it burns you, it's way too hot. By the way, there's a lot to explain when it comes to paint correction. So I'm trying to uh, give you all the information that I know right here in this video. And I'm sure I'm missing something. There's gonna be plenty more, but if you do have questions, please ask them away in the comments. I'll do my best to answer all the questions and any questions that you have on this subject. And I'll probably do 
uh, more advanced videos too. But this is kind of just to introduce you to the different machines, tools, products, the different types of panels, arm speed, working speed, uh, your working area. We're gonna get into some of this stuff. So now we're actually gonna start polishing the vehicle and we're gonna put some compound here uh, on this pad and we're gonna start with a sec section here and start actually polishing or compounding. So I'm gonna use the Supreme Cut here. When you're first using a pad, it's dry. So you wanna use a little more compound than you would uh, just to get the pad saturated and nice and wet so you got all these fibers ready to go called priming the pad. Just rub that in a bit. All right. There's some rules before you put the pad, the machine to the car. Check our speed here. I'm gonna start off a little slower and I can uh, turn it up if I need to. I'll just go to four and a half. Cord. The front of this car is uh, covered in paint protection film, so I'm not gonna be doing any paint correction on there, so that's why I'm starting on the door here. You don't wanna rub the cord against the paint, so usually you put it over your shoulder, somewhere out of the way. You never wanna start the buffer when it's not on the vehicle. If you start the buffer now, it's gonna sling compound all over you and all over the car and everywhere else. You don't want that. So, cord behind the shoulder. Before you start the machine, make sure that pad's on the car. And then we're gonna work in a section here. Get this mirror out of the way a little bit. And you're gonna see me, I'm gonna work in this section here. When you're just starting out, when you're doing paint correction, I'm gonna show you how to start, which is kind of a crisscross pattern. We're gonna work in a box, overlapping sections. We're gonna do one section pass. And that's kind of how a lot of beginners learn how to do paint correction. As you become more advanced, you may see guys who don't use the box at all. I don't typically, buff in a grid, as I'm buffing, I can kind of tell, if, especially if it's a darker vehicle, you can almost kind of see through the compound and see where you're at when you're polishing. Uh, again, that's just gonna come with feel and experience. The more you do it, the more feel you have, and the more confidence you'll have in what you're doing when you're correcting this paint. So uh, I'm just gonna go ahead, you're gonna see me do a section pass here in this section. And um, typically, I don't wanna go over this line, so what I would do here is I'm just gonna work this section first and then I'm gonna work this section and I'm just gonna do that and, and you guys can see how that's done and then uh, we'll talk after that. So I'm actually just gonna do this section here. I'm gonna show you how that grid will work. If you're starting on a hood, usually I cut it into fourths and I'm gonna do this. Uh, you know, overlapping passes, this is what it looks like. I'm gonna do five passes, uh, you'll see if you wanna count. Spread my product out a little bit. That's one. If you look real close, you can see I have a couple lines on this backing plate here. So when it comes to pressure, which is another variable, when I'm holding this, I'm barely putting any pressure. I'm just letting the machine do the work mostly, and I'm just keeping that machine from falling on the ground. You can see this as I put more pressure on. You can see that if you get real close, you can see it spinning around. If I put too much pressure on it, if I put too much pressure on it, 
the machine bogs down. You can see it barely moving now. You want that line to be moving. When you first start a vehicle and you're doing paint correction, you want to do a test spot. And what you're looking for is to get your desired results in the least amount of time and the least amount of steps. So my desired results for this, I want to make it as perfect as possible because I'm going to put a ceramic coating on it. If you have a business of your own or you're just doing this in your driveway, a lot of times, a lot of times people don't want perfect paint. So figure out what your customer wants, figure out what their budget is, and then go from there. This is a white car. I guarantee you a lot, 95% of people are not even gonna notice any scratches on this car outside unless it's in direct sunlight. But if you're a detailer, you're probably not a normal person. So you want this looking at as beautiful as it can. So we just did our first section here. I have a Eagle Edges towel here. This is the Eagle Edgeless, the rag company's most popular towel for detailing. And then I'm actually gonna wipe it down with IPA. This is gonna remove any, any oils or anything in the compound so you can actually see the true surface of what you just did. So after each section, and once you've done your test spot, you know how much correction you're doing because it'll vary on each diff uh, on different cars. Uh, these German cars typically have hard paint, meaning it's hard to scratch. And if it's hard to scratch, it's gonna be hard to polish out the scratches. Soft paint is very soft where it scratches easily and your compounding sessions are probably gonna be a lot less time consuming on a soft paint versus a hard paint. So we're gonna see what we got. We're gonna see how much correction that we've got with those five passes on this car. And then we're gonna adjust. All those variables that I've told you about, you can adjust. So if we want to work that section longer, if we wanna put more pressure on there, if we wanna work down in smaller sections, those are all gonna be the difference makers uh, and things that you'll have to adjust to, to get your desired results. So let's take a look here. Again, this is gonna be hard for you to see, but I'll explain what I'm seeing. And, and over here, you can see where we stopped, so we got some uh, residue. Can you get that on camera? So over here, we have lots of minor swirling. This is not heavy swirling, it's not big scratches. It's really not that bad. So I see if this is 100% swirls here, and this is our section here, I'd say we probably got uh, probably right around 85% correction there. So a lot of that, those minor swirls are gone. And it looks pretty good, but there is definitely some swirls still in it. So I'm gonna actually do multiple stages of compounding here. So I'm gonna take my pad again. I'm gonna clean it. I'll show you how to clean it in a second here. And I'm gonna keep on working this section until I'm happy with it. And once I'm happy with it, I'll move to the next section, and I'll move to the next section, and I'll move to the next section. We have different machines that we work with. And you can see on this car, there's gonna be certain areas where it's gonna be hard to get that five inch machine into. This here, this will be a great uh, area for a three inch machine, right here. We have different size machines, different backing plates. So the different machines that we have this is a great area for a three inch machine. I wouldn't use a five inch machine here. It's just big and bulky and it doesn't fit right. You got this small section up here and then you got a hard corner. This could be, you could burn it. So I'm gonna bring this polisher up here and I can do this. You can try it. It's risky. But I can polish, so typically I'm putting a little more pressure up here and down there. I'm gonna use a smaller machine, but I'm just showing you that you can polish a section with this. But it is a little risky because if you get this too hot, you can burn through. So can you polish a section like that with this machine? Yes. It's a little risky. Um, I'd probably get a two inch backing plate or even a three inch would probably be less risky to do this area with. And again, I'm just gonna be uh, very careful with it. I'm gonna, not, I'm gonna try not to heat this up as much. I'll do more passes with it 
and, and maybe not as many passes be between them and I'll wipe it off and kind of see how far I'm going and how far I'm going with it. I'll typically try to get a little bit of an angle on there so I'm not directly on that line. So there's a lot of things you gotta think about when you're doing paint correction and this all comes with experience. Uh, doing it over and over, doing different cars, different sections, and uh, and you'll get it, I promise. It's not that hard once you figure out what machines, pads, polishes to use, and then it's just getting experience. When you first have that buffer in your hand, it's a weird experience, man. It's a weird experience, man. It is really weird, it feels funny. And funny. When most guys typically start, they don't go to the edges. So if I'm polishing this, you'll see them, and they'll go to like right here, they, and you'll see spots that they miss because they're afraid to go all the way up to here. When you're polishing paint, remember the section that you're working in because you can miss big, big parts, like up here. If you don't go all the way up there, that's not gonna get corrected, so you do have to polish that part. You can see it on hoods, you know, making sure you have those over, overlapping passes. So uh, we're gonna continue on here and I'll probably do some voiceover stuff and continue to talk to you guys and kind of talk you through exactly what I'm doing and what I'm thinking while I'm doing it. So uh, before that, we gotta clean the pad. Air compressor. So this built up, when you're polishing, you're gonna have residue. It's clear coat residue and it's your actual product residue that builds up and surrounds these microfibers. You need these microfibers clear so they can do their job, so they can take off more clear coat. So we'll actually start this machine and then we'll use this air chuck here. And you saw all that dust go up in the air. There's a couple different things. I'm gonna go grab our dust collector. We have a dust collector, it's just a vacuum and it'll suck up most of that dust. You don't wanna breathe in this dust. Uh, I would recommend wearing a mask if, uh, you know, I'm just doing this one car, but if I was doing this every single day, I'd have a mask on, because you don't wanna be breathing this stuff here. Working clean is the key to getting good results when you're polishing. I will clean my pad after each section pass. You'll also want to use multiple pads when you're performing a paint correction service. What happens with the pads is those fibers will start to get clumped up with product and clear coat. And after a couple panels, you're gonna notice that you're not getting the same cut you were when the pad was fresh. So you can clean the pad with a pad washer or you can just switch to a new pad and clean all of your pads when you're done. I will typically do about five or six pad changes on a vehicle of this size. These B pillars are super soft and they're sensitive. I'm first gonna compound the bigger defects out and then I'm gonna come back with a foam pad and further refine them. You're gonna see some compounding haze after this step and that's what you wanna see, it's perfectly normal. What you're looking for is consistent haze. If you see any straight line scratches through the haze, you're probably gonna see those after your second polishing stage. So if you want those scratches out, you're gonna have to keep on going with your compound and your cutting pad. And if you're working on a car with some deeper scratches, I would encourage you not to chase these down. This is where experience is gonna come into play. Not every scratch will be able to be removed from your vehicle's paint. You have to learn when to stop and to be okay with the results. And unfortunately, most of the time, this is just gonna be a gut feeling. You can use a paint thickness gauge, uh, but it's not a perfect tool. Most paint thickness gauges will only tell you how much paint you have from the metal to the top of the clear coat. It doesn't tell you how thick just the clear coat is. And each manufacturer is gonna have a different thickness of clear coat. So when you have someone who says that they want their car to be perfect, they want perfect paint, just remember that no car will ever have 100% perfect paint. There's always gonna be some scratch or swirl that's just a part of the car. It's not worth the risk of causing damage to the paint or having premature clear coat failure. I did another video on how many times you can actually really buff a vehicle's paint, and you'd be surprised how many times you can actually polish paint, but there will be a point where you run out of clear coat. And if you're working on an older car, you really don't know how many other detailers have already polished that paint. So I use a paint thickness gauge as a reference to how much paint I'm actually taking off the vehicle.
The correction process can be a long, daunting process. We've been on this for a couple days now, and I think uh, I think we're going on like 12 hours. So if you have a friend to help you, it's always great. I got my friend here, Juan. Here we're gonna knock the rest of this out. After the compounding session is done, I'm gonna wipe the entire vehicle down with an IPA solution and go through and check all my work one last time before I go to the final polishing stage. As I'm working, I continually check the results after each section. If it's not to my liking, I'll mark that area and then I'll come back and do a little more polishing to it. This particular paint is taking more passes than normal because it is a really hard paint. After you're all done compounding and you got all the bigger scratches out, think of that first step compounding, you're taking all the big defects out. You're gonna be left with micro haze or micro marring, and it's hard to tell on this white car. Uh, you can see it a little bit if you look really close. You can really see it, like on the black car that we did, we showed you, you can really see that micro haze, it stands out. So we're gonna refine that with a Lake Country black finishing pad and the number two step, which is the Supreme Polish. You can use an air hose to blow off any compounding dust. Some guys like to wash the car at this point to get the surface really clean. I don't think it's necessary. And to do that, you'd have to take all the tape off and then you'd have to wait till the car fully dries out again. I turn my machine down to three, 3.5, and I polish and refine the paint. This step on this particular paint is much faster than the compounding stage. I don't use as much pressure, and it only takes a few passes to get the results that I'm looking for. If you're working on a car with, say, finicky soft paint, you might be looking at the exact opposite. The cutting session may be quick and easy, and the polishing session might take a lot of time. Every car is a little bit different. After everything is said and done, you wanna go back and clean all the edges and all the cracks where the polish and compound can build up. I have a plastic razor blade tool here that I use and I go through every crease, emblem, and panel edge. And before you apply any protection options, you want to remove any polish. If you have any leftover polishing residue on the panel, it could jeopardize the effectiveness of the protection product that you're using. You can see the wheels on the car, they're scratched, they're just beat up, they're not well maintained. I wanted to compound them and polish them to see if I can get them to look any better. Uh, to my surprise, they turned out way better than I expected, and unfortunately for me, it just took another four hours of my time to polish the wheels out. I'm super happy I did it, they turned out great. Uh, make sure you come back to the next video where I ceramic coat them. It was just such a huge difference. looking beautiful so shiny so shiny well there it is we just got done with the paint correction on the GTI I think over uh, three days we spent about 17 hours with the correction and the polishing part of this and uh, I hope you guys learned something let me know in the comments down below if you got any questions please let me know uh, I'd be happy to answer them because I'm sure I've missed something in this video here uh, but otherwise polishing paint can be a very satisfying service to do on your vehicle. Uh, it just takes a little time. I know it can be a little intimidating at first, but now that you know the different machines, the techniques, some of the pads and the polishes, and now it's just about getting experience 
with your hands on the buffer on the paint uh, and that's the best way to learn it. So I'm gonna bring this into the clean room next. We're gonna do a ceramic coating on it. So if you like the video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and we'll see you next time.